founding partners of Troika, which I founded in 2003 together with Connie Fryer and Sebastian Noel. I'm Sebastian Noel. I'm uh, one third of uh, Troika and uh, we are like an art and design studio where we do, uh, we engage with a variety of work, um, both in like a kind of art context and, and public art, like large scale installations, uh, and also like in a like more conventional design, like graphic design and product and things like that. We met at the Royal College of Art where we already throughout the time at the Royal College collaborated on various projects. So after we graduated we moved on to found Troika. We come from different backgrounds, graphic design, animation, product, engineering. And that's uh, well, what we do in our work. We really sort of mix these different disciplines and work a lot at the moment in the realm of um, installations, large-scale large uh, art installations which incorporate the different disciplines. Ron Arad al always saying that uh, the Royal College of Art only form like unemployable people, um, which is a, a, a great wisdom for me. And it means like, uh, yeah, you have to make your, invent your own business model and that's a bit like what we've, we've been doing if there is such, such a thing. Well, I think it's mainly, um, rather than everybody being a jack of all trades, I think we are really a team of like uh, highly specialized professionals. But uh, I think everybody's uh, field is constantly, and skill set is constantly expanding because we are working together. So my starting point, for example, was really graphic design, which then throughout my VA expanded to moving image. And now, through working with Sebastian and Connie, it uh, extended and works, for example, where you can see it very literally, like the zoetrope, which we did for 1.0, uh, we really deconstructed type and one of the earliest moving image devices and made a sort of uh, 21st century version of it. And, or for example, the Firefly display. Uh, which is core of the installation all the time in the world in Terminal 5, where we really took a, or designed, obviously newly, a segmented typeface which is printed with electroluminescent ink. So I think there you can see quite clearly how like, we come from a traditional graphic design, or, or I come from a traditional graphic design content and how that then expanded and got informed through Connie and Seb and the knowledge they're bringing. You know, if I talk to Connie, she's saying things like, although we're talking about the same idea, and we might be discussing for like an hour the same idea, and then, you know, we go and make some sketch and come back and it's different. And that's, that's, what's the, that's what's the great thing, you know, that you can, oh, you made that like that, I made that like that, I should do it like that. That's, that's a great thing. Cloud, Cloud was commissioned um, by British Airways um, through a, a fantastic curator company called uh, Artwise Curator. At that time we were already making like a, another uh, piece for them, which is all the time in the world, which is this huge world clock that is uh, in, the, in the first class lounges. And they wanted something for, as, you know, as a signature piece for, for the lounges. Um, so as you enter the lounges you, you would see that something. And they didn't know quite well what it could be. So that, that's where it was fantastic because like um, Artwise and British Airways um, give us kind of carte blanche to propose anything we wanted to, to do in, in that place, knowing that it's, um, um, you know, there's a very precise context in the airport and it has to be like a, a kind of a signature for the, for the lounges. So we, we started to think about, um, you know, like the context, obviously, because we like to make like context-specific pieces, and the context is like this very, very busy shopping mall, uh, which which every airport is at the moment, and uh, you would access the lounge through a series of escalators, so they're kind of synonymous of elevation. And that's also why they placed the, the first-class lounges at that point. Um, but there's like um, knowing, you know, like uh, the client was a, an airline. There's like something that is is always very magical. Um, uh, you know, when, when you fly, it's like when the moment where you, you, you cross the cloud layer and you arrive into like a very peaceful and very ethereal 
uh, place which we thought was an appropriate metaphor for, for, for what the client was trying to achieve with his launches. Um, and at the time also we were like, a, you know, like because we were making like new kind of signal, a signalistic uh, piece with like a, the, all the time in the world, we were looking at, at all loads of uh, old technology and alternative way to make like displays and things like that. And we found um, a very old discarded plate with loads of flip dots. And uh, it was not like on, you could not turn it on, like it was fried from the 70s. But what was fantastic is like you could, you know, like just like blow on them and they would move amazingly. And we were thought like, oh, how amazing would it be to, you know, like start working with that very old different technology because it's like a very strong materiality. It's tactile, it turns, he has noise that is associated to travel and airports. And, and I don't know exactly how, how we, we, we came about to think about that. but. Um, so then we thought that would be an amazing to animate like the whole skin of a, scu a sculpture if we would cover the sculpture with, with, with thousands of them. Obviously you take like a, a technology that's from the 70s, you know, like it's been invented by, uh, um, I think the, f the first pattern was by uh, Packard Bell or Hewlett Packard, I don't remember exactly for the flip the technology and it's a, it's technology that's been uh, matured to a certain extent because it's been like uh, abandoned uh, quite rapidly. And, like, the lifespan is not, you know, it's been invented in the 70s, at the end of the 90s, it was not anymore. So um, it's, it's a very short lifespan, but, uh, uh, yet it's a fantastic thing. But it's always been applied for, um, in, in a very uh, commercial display type of arrangement. So it's always been, for example, sort of to be vertical. And as soon as you start to place it horizontal, you encounter a lot of problems. Because uh, they, they, beca again, become very technical, but you have like a, um, bearings that are, you know, like made to support all the weight of the dot in one, you know, when it's vertical, you have one bearing. If you put it horizontal, you have to introduce another bearing. So we were working with uh, the manufacturer of the flip flop, which was ab absolutely fantastic in the sense that he modified his mold, he's like made another mold for us to reintroduce like bearings and things like that, because they were very exciting. You know, yeah, everybody is very excited about, about the outcome. I mean, this face is art project, um, normally not their biggest payer in terms of manufacturing, but these people are, get really excited if they realize that you are actually really interested in their technology and because that's something normally uh, they don't get the chance to do. So there, you know, there needs to be something in it for them as well. And there's obviously a lot of sort of PR which comes their way simply because uh, well, a lot of our pro projects are uh, publicized. So that's nice for them because that's also very unusual uh, for them to see their technology uh, in such a different context, but it's also really exciting for them to learn more about their own technology through working with us almost. I see it like very much like a discussion. The first time we, uh, we, we, liked, we worked with Mike Smith Studio um, and, and, li and liked working with him because we, it, it become like a discussion about how to fabricate something. And, uh, and sometimes he's right, sometimes we're right, and sometimes we enforce something, sometimes he does. Uh, but it's a, very, it's a very nice collaboration. You know, we could like for the cloud, for example, the first time the discussion was about like, uh, you know, like milling because, you know, it's 21st century. So we take a five axis CNC machine and we mill the whole thing in foam and we like, you know, put, uh, you know, fiberglass on top and we have very light structure with all the old veining. Well, we realized that there was only like two machines in the UK that could be that big to CNC something and they are not made for CNC. You know, they, there's a lot of operation they cannot do because they made like uh, usually to make a big shape for boats or or car, so they can't really drill things in very, you know, very accurately. And that would have been like 80% uh, uh, of the budget that would have gone in producing half of the shape. And you, know, you cannot do it. So you have to find that plan B. And plan B was, uh, 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 it's like my personal fascination with, you know, more digital fabrication and, and thinking, okay, you have like something that is like a volume, how can I flatten it? You know, a hull of boats, I find them fantastic or the way planes were made, like early planes are made, you know, you have like a structure that's very simple and you have like things like ribs that are like, um, you know, cut flat and really deformed. So we've developed like, a, um, we rationalized the shape so you can, everything is like laser cut flat and then there is the skeleton and, and you reapply all the, all the, uh, those kind of flat shape 
onto the, the skeleton, but you've calculated the deformation well enough, so it, it matched perfectly. And uh, I remember like the first time we went to, to Mike Smith and told him, look, Mike, this is how we're going to build it. He said, you're crazy. It's never going to work. So that's also why we made the first prototype. So we showed him, like, see, that works. And he was like, actually, that works very well. Let's go. <laughs> you know, so that's great. But, you know, at the same time, there's many times where, you know, it, it would, we, we, we gave him a drawing about something and it, it would not say anything. And you come back and you can see that he made it better, you know. And that's great. This, we still do, like, a lot of smaller pieces in the studio. Um, but I think it's also good to to know how to work with people that have much more experience than you do in, bu in actually building the thing, because it's not quite easy. <laughs> when we're looking for collaborators, we're simply looking for people who are as excited and determined and good in what they do as uh, we are. What we do quite often is we may sort of program a prototype in-house, for example, and then look for someone who really excels in that area and who can do it almost much better than us. <laughs> the first thing that we, we, we looked at was quite interesting is like, how do you, how do you tile an organic shape with like uh, something that is uh, um, a set size? And uh, we started looking at, uh, at all our nature does it, and nature, nature does it amazingly. You could look at the seed of the, you know, like the sunflower, for example, like fantastic patterns, and it's like perfectly tiled. Or a pineapple is like a, a, you know, like a repetition, a tile repetition of a complex surface. But uh, like nature has a very amazing trick, which is called evolution, and it can make like different cell size. Um, so if you look at all those, like we started to look at that and we're getting very inspired by uh, uh, Archimedes spirals. So we started to develop like a, a scripts, you know, like that would take any kind of 3D shapes and trace like a, a very regular, regular uh, space, sp uh, space spiral. So we could like replicate what nature does. And uh, we ended up uh, having like a huge, you know, obviously it's very, very, you know, like it, it doesn't really, really work. Um, we made it work very well for uh, revolution. So any shape that is of revolution that works quite well. As soon as you start to flatten, stretch, or do like other thing, it becomes like very chaotic, and you start to have gaps. And the uh, reason why is that is because, you know, like we don't have like dots that can grow or, 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 or diminish. They have, have one size and one size only. So that was the whole. That was one of the big problems: is how to make like a, a shape that is three-dimensional, that is regularly tiled, but this is not, you know, it's organic. So that, that was quite complex, and we ended up like after many many different attempts, uh, we ended up like rationalizing quite a bit uh, the way we're doing it, and ended up like tiling manually. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no, <clears throat> there is no mathematic. I don't think. Well, maybe there's a, a great mathematician here that's going to tell me uh, the contrary, and if somebody says no, how to do the contrary? Like, uh, please get in touch because I really would like to, to know the solution. But we didn't manage to find a way of tiling something completely irregular with like regular dots. But it was quite amazing, obviously, to see it like the first time. You know, when there's like a magic about you know plugging it for the first time and seeing that thing and saying, "Wow, that's cool." And, the, and I think that's that's the same thing. You know, you can rationalize, uh, or, or you know, like you can rationalize you know artwork and, and try to explain to a certain extent. Uh, but I think there's still like I'm I'm very interested by the, like the good feeling reaction that something is provoking in you, and I think it's very sane um, to have this like direct you know uh, you know visceral approach nearly, and if this visceral approach is magic and 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 bring you like um, you know it, it it it's kind of like a disrupting something. It's interesting to me at least. The interesting thing about uh, the firefly display is that on the one hand, normally you have sort of pixel-based typefaces and at the other hand you have vector-based typefaces. Now the pixel-based typefaces uh, are really sort of efficient for displays because they need very little driving technology. The trouble is if you blow them up and you want to use them for a large-scale display, they become very chunky because you obviously only have, I don't know, 
five by seven pixels and that's it. What we were really interested in is to develop a typeface where we knew that we could work with this uh, silkscreen printing technology. That means that we weren't bound to like squares or a rectangle, which could work on any size and wouldn't lose like resolution, as it were. So what we developed was segmented typeface, which also incorporates uh, curved elements. And we wanted to make it sort of as smooth and as sophisticated as possible, while still maintaining like a sensible amount of, uh, or having only to use a sensible amount of driving technology. Because obviously you can develop a typeface with like 5,000 segments and that would be amazingly smooth, but it's totally impossible to drive. And especially um, in the context of all the time in the world, uh, the space also for the controllers was a real challenge because that wall is only like uh, 20 centimeter deep. So we also needed to uh, warrant that actually the control technology can actually fit within that space, which we put in that case uh, on the top of the display, so sort of hidden away. Somehow the little danger with technology that you can end up talking more about the technology than about like the artistic intent or the meaning of the piece. Which is, uh, which is more apparent, obviously, if you have like things that moves and, and you know, like a, a kinetic aspect of, of things. But I don't, I don't. I, I mean, maybe it's like a, a, li a little selfish, but I, I would say I don't care. But like, if it's art or design, um, criti critics are, you know, are, are working on that, and that's 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 what they should do. <laughs> When you're a student, do you have like any kind of liberty? You, 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 you know, you have, you have all the liberty in the world. You're like you're complete freedom. You can do whatever, explore whatever, go and talk to anybody, uh, which you can still do afterwards. But obviously, like uh, if you're trying to do it professionally, you can do it. Like there's many, many ways of doing it. Like but if you choose that 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 path that we have chosen, which is like to have like a professional studio where we make, you know, we make uh, we make art, we make design, we make all those wonderful thing, there is like a, obviously even if we are very free and we have like great chance of working with people like British Airway that come and say, well, do whatever you want, um, you still work within tighter constraints and, and that's why I think it's so important that you make the most of it while you're completely free.